Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. Well, hey, we're going to be in Psalm 27. Uh, Psalm 27 is where we're going to be. But before we get into God's Word, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been in a tough spot before? Have you ever been in this a place where you just everything seemed impossible? Where you didn't really have a hope? You know, we, we, we all have had those moments where we didn't really know what to do. Things kind of seem impossible. And I had one of those early on. Uh, my, when I used to live in Central Florida, I just moved there. I was a came to be the pastor of this church, and my family was young. Aaron was just a, a baby, and uh, we, we were trying to find housing, and we were able to rent a place, and uh, for about a year, we searched for somewhere to buy. And again, we, we, were, we were poor. We, we, we didn't have a lot of money, and, and we didn't ever think we could buy a house. And so we rented, and, and God just gave just a tremendous opportunity. And this opportunity was just to buy an incredible house, and it was a short sale. And, and so uh, we, we knew through some realtor friends of ours that the bank wanted this amount of money, and which would be less than half of what the people who bought it before me paid. And there this was, this opportunity. And so I put a, what I thought was a significant amount of money down to secure this sucker. Uh, that's what we say in Kentucky. <laughs> and I, yet I had one problem. I was still renting and I still had a, about five months left on my lease. And so I called the landlord and asked the landlord, I said, this is what's happening, can you help me? And he absolutely refused to help me. He says, you either pay out the last five months, or one option is you go find somebody else to take over, but they have to sign a year lease. And so for about a month, we were working through this, money was going out, we were working towards closing on this. I knew I had this, and I couldn't afford a rent payment nor a mortgage payment. And I struggled. For a month, I was looking for somebody to lease my house. How, how do you do that? It's weird, right? It's hard. We had a little kid. And, you know, little kids make messes and stuff, you know, so you come in there. And so I just got to the point where I just didn't know what to do. So I just was reading the scriptures in my office. And I was saying, God, you know, you've called me here. I know you've called me here. And I turned in my Bible to Psalm 27. And I read Psalm 27 and I have a sticky note. It's been in my Bible for a while. And here's, after I read that Psalm, I had this peace. You ever just had a moment in God's word where you just felt peace? Anybody? Y'all gonna have to talk with me today. I need a talk back sermon, all right? And I wrote this. On June the 11th, 2011, I have put my trust in God to take care of all my needs and not be afraid anymore. Now there is a happy ending. I found somebody and I bought the house and the rest is history. But sometimes you need those God winks. Have you ever had a God wink? He just kind of winks that I got you. you. You need moments like that. And how many of you can testify that you've had a moment that everything seemed to be impossible, you were at your wits end and God showed up. Anybody ever have that happen to you? Say amen. Amen. And you know what? When, when, when we are in the, the throes of fear and worry and impossibility, we forget those moments. Because we think, you know, well, the God who got us here is not the God who's going to get us there. But my prayer today is that whatever situation you're going through, maybe you're living on a prayer, that today that Psalm 27 would do for you what it did for me 
almost 12 years ago. So let's stand as we read God's word. Psalm 27, verse one. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock and my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. And I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Verse 13. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You may be seated. We are in a series in the book of Psalms. The Psalms are the songbook and the hymn book for the church. Uh, the Psalms help us see God, not just for what we wish him to be or hope him to be, but who he truly is. The Psalms uh, were the songbook of the early church and the Psalms were the songbook of Jesus. You ever know what Jesus sang? He sang the Psalms. His last night before his crucifixion, when he had his disciples in the upper room, he, he, sang, a, he sang a psalm. Matter of fact, Jesus quoted the Psalms more than any other Old Testament book. And the interesting thing is that every psalm is about Jesus. And every psalm points us to Jesus. And so the psalm we're at today, Psalm David, was written by King David. And it was written while he was on the run. He was in a tough spot. He was either A, on the run from his son Absalom, who wanted to do a coup, uh, overthrow him, and basically just rule and reign and probably kill his dad. The other thing he could have been in, we don't know for sure, is when he was on the run as a younger man from King Saul, where King Saul wanted to kill him. But what we see in this psalm is we see that despite the circumstances of his life that David had confidence. And that's what we're going to learn today. This Psalm teaches us that we can have confidence despite our circumstances when we seek the presence of God in our lives. And so what this Psalm is going to teach us, listen, this is muy importante. The Psalm is going to teach us both the source and the secret to this confidence. Would you like that kind of confidence that regardless of what's happening, you're okay. Well, you can find out today. Number one, let's look at the source of confidence, the source of our confidence. David in verse number one says, the Lord is my light, my salvation, the stronghold of my life. David here in the midst of all the minutia and the doo-doo of his life, he comes out declaring who his God is. He comes out swinging, saying that God is the illuminating, delivering, protecting person in his life. And because of that, he's not afraid. See, in David's mind and his heart, God was bigger and greater and better than his circumstances or anything that was against him. And that's why he has these two rhetorical questions. Again, this is Hebrew parallelism as well. For those of you geeky scholarly nerds, he says, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The answer, no one. The answer, nothing. Now, David says, I ain't scared. That's, in the, that's the Kentucky version. I ain't scared. But there's a lot of people that are afraid. Do you understand that we live in a world of fear? Now, what is fear? Fear is not just a feeling. Fear is not a personality type. The Bible actually says that there's a spirit of fear and God has not given it to us. But there's a difference between being afraid and being scared. Have any of you ever been scared before? <laughs> Maybe towards the end of this message, you, you, as it goes about three hours, you might get scared. Um, but, but, but scared, to be scared is a defense mechanism. And so like if you see your kids swinging on the monkey bars and one of them 
falls, you get scared, right? And so you run to help them. If you out in the middle of the night and somebody kind of comes up to you, you can't see them, you get scared. Scared is a defense mechanism. It's temporary and it even can save your life from time to time. When you're driving around here in Naples and you get scared by the crazy person driving next to you, it can protect your life. Being scared is one thing. Fear is something else. Because fear is an emotion. Fear is a disposition. It's a spirit. Here's what fear is. Fear is when you feel like you are out of control and that the circumstances in your life are too big for God. And again, we live in a culture of fear. Think about this. A study was done. It's done every year by Chapman University. And it was a study that's, that's done very, it's, it's very good. It's, it, it's a nationwide study. It, it has a good sampling base and good statistical research. And, and it asked, what are the top 10 fears of Americans? And so this was done in 2022. So speaking of Americans in 2022, but looking into 2023 and the top 10 fears of Americans, American adults in 2022 slash 2023 are this. Number one, corrupt government officials. Number one, could you imagine that? Number two, second greatest fear is people I love becoming seriously ill. Three is Russian nuclear weapons or Russia using nuclear weapons. Four, people I love dying. Five, the U.S. involved in another world war. Six, pollution of drinking water. Uh, Seven, not having enough money for the future. Eight, economic or financial collapse. Nine, pollution of the oceans, rivers, and lakes and 10 biological warfare. So if you just listen to the top 10 fears of Americans heading into 2023, is that Americans in our day, they're afraid of some impending doom, like the world's gonna end and everything's gonna unravel. So that's the biggest fear of Americans. Now, you compare 2023, 2022-2023's top 10, and then go back to 2014. Same study, same group, Here's what the top 10 fears were in 2014. Number one, public speaking. Number two, death. To quote Jerry Seinfeld, don't want any nasty emails over that. To quote Jerry Seinfeld, he says that at a funeral, it's better for you to be in the casket than to give the eulogy. (laughs) The third is heights. Fourth is bugs and snakes. Fifth is drowning. Six is blood and needles. Seven is flying. Eight is zombies and ghosts. (laughs) Nine is strangers. And 10 are are clowns. (laughs) That's kind of a big difference, right? Why do you think the fears have changed? Why do you think the top 10 fears in America are of impending doom and in 2014 there were clowns? Here's why. Answer, social media, cable news, and the mass media. Do you understand that the television news, mass media, social media, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, all this stuff has an agenda and that agenda is to create fear and division? It just, it does. You want to know why? Because fear sells more stuff. Fear is a big moneymaker. Fear is big business in America. One of my friends said, there's no such thing as a free press in America. It's all for profit. Every bit of it. And that's why seven out of 10 teenagers in America struggle with anxiety and mental health because everything is inundating their lives with all kinds of stuff that freak us out. Stephen Covey talks about the different, he talks about two different spheres. He talks about the sphere of concern and the sphere of influence. And he says in, 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 his, in his books and his writings that the problem is that in our society, we have a sphere of influence that is far bigger and far greater than our sphere, uh, uh, I mean, our sphere of concern, which is far bigger than a sphere of influence. That is, concern is we are inundated with all kinds of information. We know everything that's happening. 
uh, in an instant. We know things that are happening across the street. We also know things that are happening around the world. We have all this bad news and all this propaganda. And so our sphere of concern is really big, but our sphere of influence, being able to do anything about it, is really small. And so what happens, in other words, we hear so many bad things, but we can almost do nothing about them. We can't do anything about them. And so there's so many things in our day to fear. Well, David here is saying, I'm not going to be afraid, even though if you read the text, he had a lot of things to be afraid of. In verse two and three says, when evildoers assail me, to eat up my flesh, though an army encamp against me, a war arise against me. That's, that's pretty big stuff. Like, I don't know if you had a good week or a bad week, but no matter how bad your week was, it is highly unlikely that you didn't have people who literally wanted to murder you this week. David did. If you read the entirety of this text, David had people who wanted to kill him. So he had the fear of death. David had people who were spreading lies about him. He had the fear of deception and ruining his reputation. And David even talks about the fear of losing his family. He had desertion. So his fears were death, deception, and desertion. And let me just let you in on something. Being a Christian isn't all gee whiz and hallelujahs. Sometimes being a Christian, it's just hard. It's really difficult. Sometimes we think, well, if I just become a Christian and, and ask Jesus to save me, then everyone's going to like me. Everyone's going to be happy. I'm going to be really good, good, and I'm going to be really cool. No, you won't. Be honest with you, that's when life gets increasingly more difficult. Because what happens is you used to be in collusion with the world, but now you're in collision with the world. And so when you become a Christian, people are going to turn on you. People are going to turn away from you, and people are going to turn you down because you love Jesus. Just telling you right now, straight up. David here says, listen, I got tons of stuff against me, but verse two and three, he says, but my adversaries, they're gonna stumble and fall. My heart shall not fear. I will be confident. Why was David confident? Why was it? Well, going back to verse number one, what does he tell us about God? He says, God is light. God is salvation. God is stronghold. Now you're maybe new to church or maybe you come to church all the time and you hear me say stuff and you have no idea what I mean. Well, join the, join the club, right? There's some days I don't even know what I mean. So, but sometimes you hear these words like God is light and God is salvation and God is a stronghold. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, let's just think about the metaphors here. So there, each of these are kind of metaphors, especially when it comes to like God is light. Well, what is light? Well, number one, light illuminates, right? So God illuminates. He brings life. Light typically brings life. Light, um, light is truth. It dispels dis distortion and distraction and deception. Light is pure. Light is righteous. And so what he's saying is that God is light and he's illuminating. He's life. He's truth. He's pure. And then salvation in the Septuagint, it's actually translated savior. So what does it mean to be a savior? It means to have someone who rescues you. And so a savior rescues and redeems. He removes our sin, removes guilt, removes shame. And stronghold just means security. So God, what David declares is that God is illuminating, he is saving, and he is security. And, and if I went around the room, like you would probably, well, I agree with that. Well, I mean, God's light, he's not dark. You know, there's no darkness there. Uh, God is salvation, God is a stronghold. And here's what happens. We believe this, this stuff. Like if I were to come to you and say, is God awesome? You say, yeah, he's awesome. And I say, is God all powerful? Yeah, he's all powerful. And, and is God everywhere? Yeah, God, is God all, yeah. I mean, all these things. But here's the thing. If all those truths, which are true, were just abstract, things that you know or things that you believe, will that be enough? Just to know that God's all powerful? Like, like you're sitting here struggling and you're, you're needing an answer and you, well, I know God's all powerful. What makes the difference? Here's what makes the difference. What makes the difference is one little word. If all I said to you, you know what? Hey, don't be upset. God's light, God's salvation, God's a stronghold. You're gonna look at me and say, well, okay. But here's what makes the difference. One little word. David doesn't say God is light, God is salvation, God is a stronghold. What does he do? He says, God is my light, my salvation, my stronghold. He takes it from the abstract and makes it personal. Here's why. If you just believe in your head that God is these things, but not, not is these things, not, that he is not this for you. 
See, you can know it's true and still be searching for something else to be those things. And so you can know that God is light. You can know that God is savior. You can know that God is security, but unless you make it personal and that he's your light and your security and your strength and everything to you, then you're going to go seek other things. You're going to go seek something else to be your light. You're going to seek something else to be your salvation. You're going to seek something else to be your security. But David says here, no, he is my light. And if you have a relationship with him, he's your light and he's your salvation and is your security. And what David here is saying is meant to bring us to our knees and make our jaws drop and cause us to be in awe and wonder that everything God is, he is for us by his grace. See, notice here, David does not begin with his troubles. He begins with his theology. Paul David Tripp said that theology properly understood does not just define who God is, but redefines who we are in God by his grace. See, when you truly understand theology, the study and understanding of God, you understand him as theology properly understood is one that sees it applied to themselves. And so here's what I mean by all this, that if you are a Christian, say amen. amen. Here's what this means to you today based on God's word. That because of Jesus, by God's grace, I have light. And I don't have to walk in darkness or uncertainty anymore. That I don't have to worry about what they say about me or the lies they spread about me because God knows the truth. What this text is saying is that because of God's grace, I am saved. I have been rescued from my sin. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, shame and guilt no longer have a claim over me. Because of God's grace, I have a stronghold. I have a place of rest. Does anybody just get tired I just get tired of this rat race, T tired of parenting, tired of marriage, tired of working, tired of doing stuff, tired of going to church. I'm glad y'all didn't say amen to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to rest in my goodness or ability. I rest in God. See, David believed that the God of the universe was his God. And he refused to be ruled by fear because he knew that his God was greater than the haters. That his God was in control of his circumstances and that his God was infinitely good. So David's source of confidence wasn't in his self. David's source of confidence was in God because all that God was and is was for him. And you can say the truth, same truth for you. The source of confidence, God alone. But then the second point, stay with me, is the secret to our confidence. So, if you're so basically what I'm telling you is that it, when you are afraid, if you want confidence, that confidence is found in God alone. And now you're looking at me, well, then how do I, how do I find that? How do I get it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's keep asking here. Verse four, David says, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after. So if you're David and you've got armies trying to chase you down and kill you, you you've got people spreading lies about you, you've, you've got all this, that, and the other happening to you, what do you think you would ask God for? Like, if you have anything you want, you ask God, what's the thing you're gonna be seeking? Well, probably you and I are gonna be asking God for bigger weapons. <laughs> oh, we're gonna ask God to send an angel army to nuke them all. Or you're like, well, I don't want to hurt people. You may pray, well, God, just beam me up. Get me out of here. You know, a lot of our prayers are, God, just get me out of this. You may ever pray, Lord, get me out of the mess I just made. 
You know, sometimes we even say, Lord, bless my mess or Lord, get me out of my mess. But you know, David here, he, does, he says the one thing I'm asking, the one thing I'm seeking, what you read in this text is he did not ask for God to take his circumstances away. Normally, that's what we do. God, just take me, take this away from me, take this problem away from me, get this out of my life. Or he didn't ask God, you know, give, hey, listen, God, give me, some, give me some of this or give me some of that. He didn't even ask God to save him. He says, the one thing I want, the biggest desire of my life, the biggest ambition of my life is what? To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So notice here, stay with me. He does not ask God for a change of circumstances. He asks God for an encounter. He wanted more of God in his life. What we typically want, we don't necessarily want more of God. We just want less of the junk. David says, no, the biggest ambition of my life is I want more of God. I want to dwell in his house all the days of my life. I want to inquire in his temple. I want to gaze upon his beauty. Now, that's something interesting there. This word gaze here doesn't mean just kind of look at and then look away. It means to stare deeply at. So like some of y'all go through these Instagram stories and you see something, something goofy or this, that, and the other. And you know, normally like you get this little short frame and it just, it goes away, but you hold down the button. You hold on, you're gazing, you're looking at it. Or, or think about it this way. This whole idea of gazing is, is to sense and savor. So just imagine, maybe, maybe you've been to the Grand Canyon. So just imagine you fly wherever you're going to fly to to get to the Grand Canyon. And you get in the car and you drive all the way out there. And you get to the southern rim of the Grand Canyon. And you go and you walk like a half a mile or a mile up to the observation point, And you look out into everything. And you stand there for 30 seconds. And you turn around and go back in your car and go home. You ain't going to do that with the Grand Canyon. When you go to the Grand Canyon and you go into all that trouble to get to the Grand Canyon, you look at it and it's going to take your breath away. It's amazing. It's incredible. Well, that's what he means by gazing. You know, the one thing that's pretty universal here in Naples is you're going to find people at sunset where? Where are you going to find people at sunset in Naples? The beach. People pay a lot of money to have a sunset at the beach. They don't care how many no seams are out there. Because <laughs> what are they looking for? Sunset. It's beautiful. You gaze at it. That's what he's saying here. He's saying he's gazing upon beauty. You understand that our culture is obsessed with beauty. And we have the world telling us what beauty is. Think about all this stuff that people say, this is beautiful, that's beautiful. We are obsessed with beauty. We are obsessed with the beauty of art. We're obsessed with the beauty of music. We're obsessed with physical beauty, with physical, uh, physical fitness. We're obsessed with face and celebrity and, and people spend a lot of money on plastic surgery and all kinds of stuff. Doesn't look natural sometimes, but they spin it because they think in their mind, and it's going to make me look beautiful because the world tells me I got to have lips really, really big, you know, like this to go to, to do this, that, and other. And there's this, that. Look, listen, you know, like, hey, listen, guys, when you get older, you trade an upper chest for lower drawers. It just happens. You can lipo suck it, you can lift it, you can do whatever you want. Listen, it is what it is. Gravity's gravity, okay? But look, we are so obsessed with beauty and we look for beauty. You know why? Because we were made for beauty. We crave beauty. And the only one who is ultimately, the, listen, everything that we find beautiful is just a mere reflection of God who is ultimately beautiful. And so David's like, listen, no, no, no. Listen, I don't, I don't need to change the circumstances. That would be good. I need more of God. Now you're like, well, man, David's super spiritual. I ain't David. Listen, David's pretty messed up. You read the Bible? Like, David had some issues. Like, dude killed a dude. Well, y'all know the story, so I ain't going to get into all that. What I love about the Bible is it's a very honest book. All the people in the Bible that even we call heroes had flaws. They had failures. They were messed up. And here's the other thing I love about the Bible. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat the world. The Bible basically says the world sucks. It just does. The world is broken. It's messed up. It hurts, there's suffering, there's pain. There's a lot of ugly out in the world. The Bible does not sugarcoat the fact that we live in a fallen, broken world, period. 
But here's what David is teaching us. David is teaching us the secret is not to deny reality. See, the new ageism, we have a lot of new age folks. New ageism, even Eastern, Eastern mysticism, just says, just deny reality. This ain't real. This ain't real. You tell somebody that's got cancer that's dying, that ain't real. That's an illusion. You're a fool. It's horrible. But David says the secret, here's the secret. This ain't the secret like, you, like Oprah's talking about the secret. I'm talking about the real secret. Here's the real secret. Is that if all you do is meditate on the ugly of this world, and if all you do is meditate on the ugly of yourself, you're not going to make it. David says the secret is this, is that there is one who exists who is more beautiful than the ugly that's surrounding us and inside of us. And if you want to make it in life, focus on the beautiful one rather than the ugly things. The secret is to gaze at your God who is more beautiful, bigger, and infinitely beyond anything in this universe. And when you do, when you gaze at God who is greater and bigger and beautiful and infinitely better than anything else, it will right size everything. Because what happens is when we look at everything else, it's distortion. And if the one thing that you seek after more than anything else, if it's anything other than God, it will never be able to give you what your heart needs because everything in this fallen, broken world pales in comparison. It can't satisfy. It cannot help you. Think about this. If you are dying with cancer, it doesn't matter how much money you make. Yeah, you may get better treatment, but if you're dying, you're dying. Listen, it doesn't matter how good your job is if your marriage is failing and, and your job, listen, if you're out pursuing all these, they won't help you in the end. All you people that are trying to be some awesome high school athlete or college athlete, you may have some stories to tell, but they won't save you at the end. All these things that we pursue and make above all, it's sad because the only one who can truly satisfy is God. Paul David Tripp again says this. He says, it's sad that Christians will spend themselves into debt and search for something else to give them joy. He says, it's sad that Christians will tear each other down and tear each other apart in marriage, searching for someone to give them love and fulfillment that another human being can never give you. He says, it's sad that Christians will destroy their bodies by eating themselves into bad health, carrying out the evidence of their gluttony because they're searching for satisfaction. He says it's sad for Christians that will treat the church like consumers, asking the church to meet your definition of what will satisfy you. Nothing will other than God. Because everything that's beautiful is just a mere reflection of him. But when you gaze at the jaw-dropping beauty of the Lord, it causes you to stop thinking of yourself and your problems, and it focuses you on something greater. It radically decenters yourself. We got any moms in the room? Say amen. 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 All right. Any dads in the room? Say amen. 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 All right. Amen. I was there when all three of the critters were born. And they came out as critters, all right? They just did. I mean, think about this. They, their eyes, you know, pick their tongue out and they eat and they poop. That's about all they did for a few months. I remember the moment I first saw my kids face to face. I remember, never will forget, indelibly, this has left a mark in my heart and mind when I first saw my son Aaron, the firstborn. As a mom, talking to April, when, when she went through the pain of all of that, she saw the kids. There's something about a mom when they see their child face to face, it does something. Listen, I've never, listen, I've never seen an ugly baby. I've seen something that came really close, but <laughs> never seen an ugly baby. But here's the thing. When you see that baby face to face as a parent, man, it slaps you in the face and takes your, it, it knocks the self-centeredness out of you. 
You know, I've said this before. I didn't realize how selfish I was till I got married. I didn't realize how self-centered I was till I had kids. But what God does through parenting is that when you have this other child, God uses children to decenter you and change your priorities. Well, that's what this gazing is. When you look at God, it kicks the self-centeredness out of you. When you see how awesome he is. I gotta hurry up. Verse five and six. We got seven more verses to go. Um, he says this, he says, so I'm going to gaze, I'm going to gaze upon the beauty of God. And then verse five, he's declares something. He says, he will do three things. He will hide me in his shelter. He will lift my head up. He will, he will, he will notice for those of you grammatical folks in the room, that is future tense. It means it hadn't happened yet. He says, I'm going to gaze upon the beauty of God. I'm going to inquire in his temple. And here's what he's going to do. I'm trusting. I have confidence that God's going to do it. Then verse six, he uses this now, but conjunction, junction, what's your function? <laughs> but it ain't happened yet. He's going to do it, but it ain't happened yet. So what am I going to do while he ain't done it yet? Here's what I'm going to do. I am going, this is a short version. Praise the Lord. I'm going to worship. I'm going to thank him for what he's going to do, even though he hadn't done it yet. Because I know he's going to make a way, even though I don't know what the way is. See, that's the, the logical response to seeing God for who he is, is to worship him. To worship him privately, but also to worship him with other people. Think about this. If you find something beautiful, like beautiful music, and that's subjective, okay? Beautiful art. If you find something beautiful, the natural thing is you want to share it with others. It, beauty produces a joy that's only completed when you share it with others. So, hey, you find this song on Spotify. Hey, listen to this song. This is awesome. You see this piece of art. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, you go to this place around the world. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, you see this brisket at Mission Barbecue. It's awesome. And you want to share it with other people, okay? You understand that when we gather on Sundays, it's just not for you to be lectured at and for you to do Christian karaoke. Do you understand that when we gather Sunday after Sunday, we're rejoicing, we're shouting, we're praising our beautiful God. And we're pointing each other saying, hey, he's beautiful. He's beautiful. Like some of y'all, I mean, I, I listen to you sing. You ain't beautiful in your voice, but God's beautiful. Amen. <laughs> and when we're hearing each other singing, we're like, wow, God is awesome. Because listen, worship is not entertainment. If you came here to be entertained by me or the music, you're going to miss out on the one who matters the most. Because worship is not entertainment. Worship is an encounter with the living God. And when we worship together, God shows up, God shows out, lives are changed, relationships are healed, and chains are broken. So then, so like, man, you read verses 1 through 6, you're like, yeah, let's go, come on. Then you read verses 7 through 12. So David takes this talking to himself to now talking to God. And so like, he's like, listen, God, you are this, you are this, you are this to me. I know this is going to happen. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. But then we don't have time to read it all. But then David kind of gets a little like neurotic. He starts freaking out a little bit. And I'm just going to read some of the things he's praying to God. He says, God, hear me when I cry. Answer me. Don't hide your face from me. Don't turn me away. Don't cast me off. Don't forsake me. Don't give up on me. What's going on here? Like he shouldn't even say, all right, God, let's go. <laughs> There's something inside of him that's like, what's going on? Verse 80 says, you said, seek my face. Lord, I'm seeking your face. But I'm struggling. Has that ever been you? Like you want God? You want more of God? And you're like here and you're like, ah, let's go. And then you're like, but there's something that's like, this something's off. I'm worried. Some of you come to church and you think that you got to pretty yourself up really good so that God will listen to your cries. And you're like, well, you know what? If I come to God and trust in him and man, I, I got to be a better person. Like I got to start like being nice to people and I got to start doing this, I got to start doing that. I got to clean myself up so God will accept me. That's the same thing David was kind of thinking. That's why he was worried. But we know something David didn't know. You know what we know? See, here's the problem. David, David thought that his sin 
would hide God from him and hide him from God. David thought, my sin is gonna cause God to turn away from me. My sin is gonna cause God to forsake me. Because David in his heart, listen, just like you, you're sitting there in the chair and you're like, man, I, I don't deserve God. I don't deserve anything from God. I deserve misery. And some of you are like, like, David knew, he knew he deserved to be cast off. He knew that he deserved to be forsaken, but he trusted in God, even though he had concerns. Because he didn't know what we knew. He didn't know what we know. And here's what I want to tell you. You, if you are a believer, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you do never, you never, listen, stay with me. We're almost done, I promise. Five more hours. <laughs> if you are a Christian, you never have to worry about God turning his face from you. If you are a Christian, you never have to worry about God forsaking you. If you are a Christian, you never have to worry about God casting you out. You know why? Because Jesus was cast out for you. Jesus was forsaken for you. Jesus took the punishment you deserve. Jesus lost the face of God so that we could get the face of God. Jesus was cast out of the presence of God so we could be brought into the presence of God. Jesus was forsaken by God so you and I would never be forsaken by God. So as David ends in verse 13, he's, he's like, I'm, he's messed up. And then he gets to verse 13. He says, but you know what? He says, I believe that I should look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He ends by preaching the gospel to himself that even though he didn't know how and even though he didn't deserve it, he still declared his confidence in God's goodness in his life that he believed that regardless of what would happen to him, he was gonna be okay, that either he was gonna be rescued and still be alive or he was gonna be resurrected and live again. And here's the truth. The rest of the story is, is that David would see the goodness of God in the land of the living and he would ultimately be rescued from the cave he was in but it wasn't because of his goodness. God did not hear David's cries because David was good. God did not hear David's cries because David went to church. God did not hear David's cries because David was baptized. God heard David's cries because of his son, Jesus Christ, who would be resurrected from the dead. You and I can have confidence in this life and in the next life because we have seen the goodness of God in the land of the living in the face of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word is tabernacle among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. In other words, Jesus is the house where David wanted to dwell all of his life. Jesus is the face that, Jesus, that, that David wanted the most. And Jesus is the temple where David wanted to be because Jesus is God with a face. And the only way we can see the face of God is in the face of Jesus. And if you want to see the beauty of God, look deeply at the face of Jesus. So let's end with this. I said in the very beginning that we can have confidence despite our circumstances when we seek the presence of God in our life. And so you're like, well, that's what I want, preacher. I want that. I want to seek God's presence. How can I do it? Verse 14 tells us, you say, well, how does that tell us? Listen to the words of David. He says, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So our English American idea of waiting is like going to the doctor. You might have to go to the doctor this week. I had to go to the doctor with a kid because he was dumb. And when you go to the doctor's office, they say, well, you just sit here and we'll get you when we're ready. And then what they do is that after like an hour, they'll call you in and they'll put you in another room and they'll say, you sit right here and we'll get to you when we're ready. It's just passive waiting. And you sit there, like I was in, I was in the doctor's office with, with this kid. I was about to say his name. And uh, now you know it's a he. But anyway, um, and... Um, and I was sitting there because I get bored. And so I'm sitting here and I'm playing with the skeleton in the, on the wall and looking at different things because I'm bored. I got to do something, right? And, and my son's like, don't do that, don't do that. And that's what a lot of us, we think waiting is you just sit there and do nothing. That's not what the Hebrew word wait here means. This is, this is worth the whole sermon, okay? Stay with me. I'm almost done. The word waiting here means to put yourself 
in a situation so that when something happens, you're ready to jump on it. It's, it's active waiting. It means you put yourself in the right environment where you think you're going to encounter the thing you're looking for. And so like if you're a fisherman and, you know, I went out with a guide and he, listen, this guy, he knows where all the fishing holes are. And he went to all these places. A good fishing guide will put his clients or her clients in the right location where the fish are. Like they don't take you to their backyard pool. Unless they got like fish in there. What they do, what you do is if you are, if you want to be a catcherman, not just a fisherman, you put yourself in the right position so that when the fish bites, you're ready. The same is true. If you want to be in the presence of God, you got to put yourself in the right environment and the right place where you can encounter it. So here's the practicality of this whole sermon. Stay with me. Almost done. How do I do that? Simple. Number one, start every day gazing at God in the word. Get your Bible, get your phone, get in the word. Not just a checklist, get in the word. Where's God in the word? Experience him, even when you don't feel like it. Second, spend time in prayer. But not just asking God for stuff, not just gimme, gimme, gimme prayers, but spend time really praising God. Like if you're going through a crisis, instead of spending like 90% of your prayer asking God to get you out of the crisis, spend 90% of the prayer praising God for who he is. Third, be thankful. Live a life of gratitude. Four, worship. Worship him privately. Worship him with other believers. That means coming to church. If you want an encounter with the living God, you need to be in the house of God with the people of God on the day that God has said you to be. The key to Christianity is showing up. The key to the Christian walk is keep showing up. The last thing is walk in humility. Trust in God. Look to him alone. Do you want an encounter? Do you need confidence? It comes when you experience the presence of God in your life. My prayer is, is that today, on June the 25th, 2023, that you say, I'm trusting in God and I'm not gonna be afraid anymore. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, I just want more of you. This one thing I ask, this one thing I seek, is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze at the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Holy Spirit, for those in this room who do not know you as Savior, make them so miserable that they have to give their life to you today. Like flat out miserable. And God, those in this room that are scared to death or those watching online that are scared to death, God, would you just give them a wink? Give them a wink in your word. Give them a wink and somebody showing kindness to them. God, provide, because fear is not our future. You are. And God, help us to never forget about your goodness. And may we always sing all of our life about the goodness of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing about the goodness of God. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church, go out and be the church, have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.